Uh, Jack, thanks so much for doing this in, this interview. That's you, no the, problem. Do you know anything about Sporting Memories Network? The... I've, well, I've seen it a bit on the internet and that, so yeah. I know it's just spreading the word and trying to it's for dementia and that sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, it it really has fantastic results for people with dementia. Yeah, and and isolation and feelings of depression. You know, that you've yeah. got a common subject of conversation which isn't dangerous or difficult. Yeah. And it brings back great memories for people and it's yeah. been found that they spark the ability to, to regenerate more memories. So it's actually I saw that, good. yeah. Very That's brilliant. People. So, so if you, know, you want to do you want to have a chat then about anything yeah, you so like? Yeah, what, what the latest thing that, that we've got is this um, memorabilia, sort of sport, history of sport or sport in 100 objects. And they, we've, yeah. we've asked various people to do just to, to pick out an object and talk about it and yeah. have it, it, its effect or importance in their lives. So I, I, did a, I had a Welsh rugby shirt, which right. the Welsh Rugby Union gave me with my name on the back. And I yeah. couldn't work out whether it was an insult or uh, or a recognition <laughs> of my career. But as things I played against Wales and lost four times, I'm not sure what they were what they right. were trying to say. But I talked about that, and and we spoke to right. a lady called Catherine Granger who did. Yeah, yeah. It was a great rower, and she talked about uh, number five, lucky number five lane, which she won a gold medal in. So it's it's sort of, and then we talked about. Okay. So am I? Am I? Am I chatting to just chatting to you? Yeah. Yeah. About just keep chatting to me. I think we're probably on. We're, we're both going to be on this. Yeah. 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 We're, we're on fine. record now. So, um, right. first things, uh, Jack Russell. Congratulations on a recent nomination as Gloucestershire's greatest ever cricketer. How did you respond to that? Thank you, Alistair. I was uh, I was choked. I'll be honest with you. I was so moved with it because the great cricketers that were involved I mean you're going back to WG Grace and I think I beat WG Grace in the semi-final or something um so whether well, that shows how old I am I'm not, I'm not sure but it it was I mean you got players like Wally Hammond and Mike uh, Courtney I know not the overseas it was English players wasn't it so it was Wally Hammond Jessup um Tony Brown was in it you know just um players that you and I played with so it was I, I was just, and I got a, uh, a text from Andy Brassington actually saying, well done. And I said to Brassy, uh, I said, Brass, I'm just so choked. I can't believe it that yeah. uh, that's happened. So I'm very proud, Alistair, very proud. That's very well deserved as well, Jack. Thank now, you. Now, Jack, we're doing this series on sporting memorabilia and talking about items of sports equipment or clothing that are, are special to people. And uh, I know about your hat. Tell us about your, your floppy hat. Well, it's funny you should mention that because actually you were there the day that I received it when yeah. we were both playing for Gloucestershire and it was my first year as a professional. We played in the and I played my first game. I didn't have the hat then, um, but when I turned professional in 82, you were, uh, you were one of the leading batsmen in the first team. So you were there when I got presented with my hat. Uh, in fact, I think we all got a hat. Yeah. You probably got one as well. Yeah. yeah. I remember Bro I remember Chris Broad having one yeah. and having his and taking his to knots and having his for a long period of time. And we all got this floppy hat. And um, so I had it the first day of my professional career, and it managed. To, I managed to keep it going uh, till the end of my professional career, like 24 years later. So it, it managed to survive that long. I'll, I'll tell you how in a second, but. Uh, that the very first morning of my professional career, I remember Tony, the late Tony Brown, saying to us, um, "Here's all your hats and everything. Welcome everybody." Cause he was sort of like the secretary of the club and a bit like right. team manager. We didn't sort of have a manager. And Graham Wiltshire was our coach. Yeah. I remember getting together outside on the grass and uh, getting a hat. And then he he brought out this piece of paper, and it was the uh, it was just at the start of the Falklands War because it was April 1982. And he read out this, he started to read from this piece of paper and my jaw dropped because he said, he actually read out, he said, all those aged 18 or below have to go down to the army barracks down in uh, White Ladies Road in Bristol and sign on to go and fight in the Falklands, you see. So I thought, oh my God, my career's lasted like one game and it's my first day and blimey, I've got to go and fight the Argies. It was like, <laughs> I'm not going to see a crime. I might never play cricket yeah, you know, so that, then it ended up being a wind-up, so everybody had a laugh about it. So I'll never forget that morning because that, that was the day I got the hat. But also I thought that my career had finished before. Oh, it kind of ended in the, in the yeah. day. Yeah, oh, okay. but uh, the hat sort of, um, it managed to last the whole of my career. And 
it, people think it's a superstition thing. I suppose it was. And even to this day, if I don't know where it is, 24 hours a day, I have a bit of a panic attack. Because when, we, when we're in the, trend, the, the dressing room all those years, you know, it's like practical jokes. I said, look, lads, you can do whatever you like. Just don't touch my hat or my gloves because they're the most important thing. The rest of my kit, you can burn it or whatever. All my clothes, a lot. you can blow my car up. I don't care. Do what you like. But I don't mess with the hat. And I used to take it home every night yeah. with my gloves. And I used to, even at the hotels, I wouldn't leave it at the ground. And even if we were on tour, when we were playing away, I'd be in the hold. You, your luggage would go into the hole, but up in the, with the hand luggage up in where you would sit in the plane, I would always keep my hat and my gloves in my bag, which eventually, over a period of time, with the, the smell from the gloves and the hat, not many people on the plane really wanted to sit next to me, really, with my hat and my gloves tucked under the seat. So it's a prized possession of mine. My kids think it's more valuable to me than them. Um, and I just, it's just one of those things, and it's sort of become... People are telling me it's like one of the most famous hats in cricket, but I, I don't know. That, I'll let other people judge that. But it's been an important part of my career, and I suppose every photograph, more or less, um, certainly in first-class cricket, you know, my hat. I would be wearing my hat. So it, it's it's had a bit of a bashing over the years, Alistair. I've got to say that. Well, and yes. It, it, it's had one. It's, it's, it's had one or two mishaps, which. Um, I did leave it outside the house on the drive one night in my bag, which I must have been so exhausted, I, I, I didn't even take it into the house. And luckily, we lived in the middle of nowhere, so there weren't no, no neighbours, and nobody, nobody stole it. Um, I, that, I nearly lost that one night. Um, and also, actually, what used to happen on tour is if we, and when we were playing away, and you, you, you know what it's like, the opposition, I don't know if this is true or not, but... Certainly, opposition spectators would try and make life a little bit difficult for you, especially if you're playing in Australia. And often, the hotel fire alarm would go off in the middle of the night, in the, like in the middle of a test match. Somebody would set it off deliberately to disrupt us. And I, every, and the first thing I would grab, it would be my hat and my gloves because they'd be in the hotel. So I used to appear uh, for the roll call with my hat and my gloves underneath my arm for every fire alarm that we used to have in the middle of the night. So. Uh, I, you know, it's a prized possession, and I, and I would even to this day, I, I have to know where it is. And it has had a couple of nasty mishaps. Um, one in particular was um, in the West Indies in the 90s. I played in in the West Indies on three tours, and the middle tour, the brim. And at the end of every season, my wife used to wash it, and I used to starch the brim so the brim wouldn't flop. Repair it as well. And it would have to go into the um, into the airing cupboard, and it would have to go over when it was wet, because this is the size of my head. A biscuit jar, a tea cosy, and a tea towel. That's the size of my head. So that would go over that and stay in the airing cupboard for a few days to dry off and let the starch stiffen the brim. Well, we're in the West Indies in, in I think it was '94, and um, the brim started to get a bit floppy. So I thought, right. I've got some starch with me. I'll starch the brim, but I didn't have an airing cupboard. And I didn't, I know it's hot in the West Indies. I didn't want to leave it outside. So I thought, right, I'll put it in the oven because in our little uh, self catered apartment we, in, in Barbados, we don't, we've got this oven, you see. So I put it in the oven. Me being an expert cook, not. Um, I put it in and put it to like gas mark seven, which I didn't know what temperature that, what that was. And I left it in there. And I went off to my bedroom to repair my gloves. The test match was only a couple of days away. And Graham Hick was one of my roommates at the time. And he was in the lounge. He was reading a book or something. And about two or three minutes later, he said, Jack, have you got anything in the oven? And I shouted out, well, yeah, I have. What's the problem? He says, well, the problem is I can't see the kitchen because it's full of smoke. So the ki <laughs> I rushed into the kitchen. I couldn't even see the oven. Dived into the smoke. And I dived and I opened the oven door and I pulled, I, and the hat was hot and I pulled it out quickly and it fell on the floor. And basically, Alistair, it looked like a chocolate cake because it had just gone totally brown. And I touched the top of the hat and it all crumbled and fell to bits. Oh, no. And um, so then the test match is like two days away and I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I, I haven't got a hat. My hat, I haven't got a hat. Oh, yeah. the, brim, the brim was okay, but the top of it had just totally disintegrated. And... Um, Hickey went off and told me teammates, so they all came in and had a laugh about it. I was basically almost in tears on the kitchen floor trying to think, what the hell am I going to do? Well, the only person that repairs it 
is my wife. Right, I'll get her on a flight. She could bring out some material because the only material that I would put on it was not the modern polyester rubbish, the synthetic cricket whites now. I used to visit our old coach, Graham Wiltshire, in the winters, and he would go up into his loft and he would dig out an old pair of cricket flannels for me and I'd cut a piece out of some of his legs. So I would use that to uh, repair the hat every year. I said, right, she, and she could get on the... But that, I was dreaming because... The, the test was two days away and she, she just, it was an impossible, impossible thing to happen. So in the end, I ended up sewing, uh, cut a painting hat, which I used to wear when I went out painting on tour and put that on top and sewed that on top. So that was basically how that had survived. But if you turn the hat upside down, look on the inside, you can still see the burn marks on the inside, actually. Oh, and you can also still see the Gloucestershire badge, which was printed on that hat. We didn't have a proper badge. I don't think we could afford proper badges no, then, Iggy. No, it was the stamp on the front of the hat, yeah. and you can still see that on the inside. So uh, the hat survived. But over the years, uh, and hoping that I'm hoping that one or two people that are listening could see a photograph of the hat, because um, I sent a couple of photographs through yeah, to we've you. Yeah, we've got them. Yeah, yeah the, as, as, the hat as it was when I was with England, and then when I went back to Gloucestershire and retired uh, from international cricket, I put a Gloucestershire badge on the front. But you can see the patchwork on it, and that's our old coaches, Graham Wilcher's flannels. What cricket whites from the 1950s and 60s. <laughs> so that's that's how it was repaired. And the number on the side, 484, and you play for Gloucestershire, so you'd have a number as well, because WG Grace is number one player at Gloucestershire. And my number at Gloucestershire was 484, so I sewed that on the side, because I was quite... Quite proud of being yeah. that, you know, being that number for Gloucestershire. So you'd have your number, which was a bit before me. So you're four, probably four six. Four, yeah, I'm going to say four hundred and something. So uh, yeah. that's great. So that's how the hat and that's the hat survived, and um, you know, it's sort of still here today, and it's still my most prized possession. The biggest dilemma I've got, Alistair, is to know what to do with it when I'm gone, um, because the kids aren't really that interested in memorabilia. So it will have to go somewhere. The museum at Gloucestershire, uh, the museum trust, they keep badgering me for it and yes. say, you know, can you leave it with us? You They've know, got and, a uh, space for it, I'm sure. Yeah, so it will go somewhere eventually, and it will be here after I'm gone, which is which is great. So, but it's, it can tell a few tales over the years, uh, yeah. right from back in those early days when we played at Gloucestershire. So. It wasn't uh, always popular with the England management, though, was it? No, no. There was a my last tour to the West Indies. Um, it was uh, Lord McLaurin came in to, in to run the, the ship and uh, he was chairman of the ECB and there was this um, policy of having everybody having nice, tidy gear and looking smart. And uh, we didn't win any matches particularly, but if we looked smart, at least that was something. Um, and he sort of said, everybody's got to wear the, the team issue kit. And we got to West Indies and I thought, well, I'll, just, I'll ignore that. I'll just tidy my hat up and make it look smart and tidy for the trip because believe it or not at various times it did used to look quite tidy yeah. and uh, so I thought I'd make an effort and it was gleaming, you know, gleaming white, looked beautiful and we got to the first, uh, just before the first game, for first class game in Montego Bay and um, the manager Bob Bennett who was the Lancashire chairman came up to me and said you can't you can't wear your hat Jack, well it's my hat manager, you know I've got a, well no you can't wear it, well I'm going to wear it, I'm just going to wear it so that's it, so I left it at that anyway the, the the team meeting before the, that first class game, there was no talk about uh, the opposition or anything, and I wasn't included in the meeting. The whole meeting was about my hat. So <laughs> to this day, Mike Atherton, the captain, and David Lloyd, they ribbed me about it. They said we spent two hours talking about your hat and about five minutes on the opposition <laughs> because you were going to wear your hat. And actually, what had happened was the ECB had threatened to send me home oh, no. if I didn't wear the tour gear. And on top of that, they were going to sack Mike Atherton and they were going to sack David Lloyd, Bumble. And I thought, oh, my, but what do I do? You know, what do I do? I can't, I can't uh, get them sacked and um, I don't really want to go home. But I'll, and I spent two days on the phone to solicitors as well. So it was all cost, cost thousands in solicitors' fees. Um, and in the end, I had to relent and wear the tour issue hat. But... What I did, well, I got it in. I had because those big floppy hats, you know what they're like. They're so yeah. big, those brims. Yeah. Well, I can't keep wicket in now. I couldn't even. The thing was flopping up and down. I couldn't see a thing. So I, I got permission and I got it in writing because I thought I better cover my legal bases. That with the manager said I could cut the brim down and uh, cut the actual tour hat issue hat down to the same size as my hat. Well, that was <laughs> a hard brim, hard brimmed hat, and it was terrible to wear. You know, six hours in the sun. 
and it used to, you know, you dig into your forehead. It wasn't very yeah. comfortable at all. Um, and the, the upshot is I had to change the hat for that trip. But the, and work, walking out for the first game, Mike Atherton, he said I, I had nearly had the biggest heart attack ever because I looked at your hat from a distance and it looked like, because you cut it down, it looked like you were wearing this, the old hat. So he sort of panicked for a bit. But it, the, the strange thing was, after about a game or two, it was so frayed and looked so bad, it looked worse than my hat. So it was more <laughs> untidy than my hat. So if they'd let me wear my hat, which was all nicely done up, you know, it would have been, uh, it would have looked a bit tidier. So that's the only, it uh, sent home from a tour and the, <laughs> the manager and the captain nearly got the sack. So, oh. or the cap, the coach. So yeah, it's, had, it's caused a few problems over the years, yeah. Alistair. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, and nowadays, I suppose you look at cricket and you see the the, the conformity and the uniformity and the everything. Is there room for people like yourself and that sort of attachment to objects and hats and items uh, and equipment nowadays uh, in the game? I don't really think there is. I don't think there. I don't think there is really. I mean, it was the end of me. You know, it was '98. I'd had ten or eleven years. I thought. I'm not going to win, you know, I just, this is no good. And I was getting on a bit. So I thought I'll just retire from international cricket, concentrate on uh, trying to win a trophy at Gloucestershire. Um, And I don't think these days, you know, I look at, I mean, they change shirts every test, you know, I mean, there was a great thing with the Andrew Strauss, uh, Ruth Strauss Foundation the other week, you know, everybody had to wear red, which was great. I thought it was, they raised a lot of money for the foundation, which was brilliant, but you had to wear a, a change of shirt and uh, put the red number on the back instead of a blue one if you're England or green green for Australia early in the year and Pakistan obviously doing colour. But it does take me back actually to the fight, the 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 uh, the Nat West and the Benson Edges Cup finals we played at at Lords with Gloucestershire towards the end of my career, because two days before one final we were issued with uh, were, uh, with um, uh, cup final shirts. You see. And I thought, oh, I can't wear a new shirt in for I've, I've had this shirt for like five, six years. I can't. And you get used to. And my shirts, in particular, I had to sew into the back a double layer of to keep the wind out of my back, and also the, to keep the collar up. The back of my shirt was based. I sewed another shirt on the back of my shirt. So to have a shirt, a new shirt without that, I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. So what I had to do was, and we had some new sponsors for the for the final. So what I had to do, my poor wife, I got a Two days before the final, she stayed up all night and sewed on. She cut the badges off the nuts and sewed them onto my old shirt with my double back collars and my double back backs, so that I actually looked conform to what I supposed to, you know, look like. So, all this new kit, Alice. You know, people will probably realise I don't like new kit. You know, new kit in me do not mix. I mean, I had my over 24 years of play and I only had basically two pairs of wicket keeping gloves that I used to repair virtually every night. So. Um, I don't think, to answer your question, I don't think I'd fit in these days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I don't, I think you've got to have, I mean, you were a character yourself and you played in your own style, you know, your own way of going about things. And I think these days, if there's one thing that is lost, uh, I think those, you know, you just haven't quite got those characters because, you know, people like Phil Tufnell, for instance, you know, he wouldn't play a test match, you know, because he wouldn't do any training. You know, he was never going to run a marathon. He'd be drinking. He'd be having a pint or two. He'd be he'd be having his 40 fags a day. And But he'd win you two test matches in a series, and then you, you accepted that, you know. To get him to practice with you, to, you know, get tough as the bowl, you six deliveries was like a miracle just to get used to his bowling, you know. So I think the characters and people, probably people like Freddie Flintoff and those guys, um, they would struggle to that today. I mean, there are characters there, but I think you're in that bit of a straight jacket and you're a little bit in those pigeonholes boxed up. So, and you know, you me, Alistair, I've sort of like never really conformed to anything generally. And I've always gone against the grain and annoyed a lot of people over the years doing it, um, including myself and my teammates. So it's sort of, um, I probably wouldn't fit in now. So I just let the youngsters get on with it. And you now don't fit in with the model, of the the idea of a, somebody who's retired from cricket because you've pursued a very successful uh, painting career. Tell us about that. How did you get into that? Well, that all started on, on wet summer days playing county cricket at Gloucestershire. It was just, um, it was getting fed up, stuck in the pavilion. And you know, you know what it was like in the pavilion, you know. And it, it was at Worcester, actually, at the new road at Worcester, when it two drops of rain, bless them, and the grounds flooded, you know. So we were there 
rained off for a few days and uh, I got fed up and um, lost all my money at cards, as you know, can happen. Um, so the meal allowance would go, that would be down the drain and got sick of watching TV. And I'm a, I am I can't sit and do nothing. Um, I've always been somebody who's trying to make so, do something productive every day, even if it's just one thing. And, and I got fed up and basically, and I'd always been interested in art. And I didn't do art at school because... I was too busy playing cricket and missing lessons, so I didn't really take any interest. But I'd always been interested in the great masters like Constable and Rembrandt and Turner and John Singer Sarge and all the great painters. Um, and I thought, well, if they can do it, why can't I? And I thought, well, if Rembrandt can do it, why can't I do it? So it, I gave it a go and I stormed out the change room at Worcester and went into town and bought a sketch pad and some pencils and started drawing up and down the back of by the River Severn there. I mean, not in front of people. It was sort of like my first sketch was a guy reading a newspaper 100 yards away. So I sort of kept it all quiet to start with. But then I found I could just, the little doodles and it was happening. It was something was happening. And then I started to do it at the cricket. And I started to do the grounds. And then I started to do my teammates. And I remember an early sketch of our old uh, scorer, Bert Avery. You remember Bert, one of the yeah. great scorers, beautiful handwriting. <laughs> The, yeah. probably the greatest cricket score books that has ever been done. Um, I remember doing one of Bert in the early days and, and teammates, and um, and I just grew up confidence and started doing it. And then I took the sketches into a gallery in Bristol. We're talking 1987 now. And I'd just been picked to go on my first tour with England to Pakistan. It was the Mike Gatting, Shackle Rana, Finger Wagging, <laughs> the, the, the big incident tour. And... Um, which caused an international incident, which ended up involving President Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and it was like chaos. But I was just one of the 12 men. I didn't, I wasn't playing, but I, I had, uh, I didn't have a lot to do in eight weeks. I played basically two days cricket, and um, I took the sketches from the summer before into a gallery in down Gloucester Road, which you know well, yeah. and uh, in Bristol, and to a guy, and he said, "Oh, I know who you are. You're you going on tour with England, aren't you?" And uh, I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, come, go and do some good sketches, and come back." We'll have an exhibition. So, I did, when we came back for the cricket season, um, I did loads of sketches in Pakistan, plus the stuff I'd done the season before, plus loads of stuff around Bristol, you know, down Bristol docks yeah. and all the all the great architecture down in town. And um, he, 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 we had an exhibition, and we were playing Sussex at the time, first game of the season, mm. and the, the first day was rained off actually. And we, I took some of the Sussex lads down to have a look with it, as, uh, look at it as well. And I remember going down there, but. To my amazement, the 40 sketches sold out in two days. Really? And really, that was the hub. That was the start of my uh, success. And um, and then commissions started to come in, and it grew from there. But it was the, I really wanted to be a painter. And, but people kept saying to me, you've got to learn to draw before you paint. So I sketched for two or three years. But then I sort of I did a big sketch of the cathedral. It took me a month. I drew it stone by stone, basically. And at the end of it, I thought, right, that's it. I'm just going to concentrate on, on the paints now and the colours and um, and started fiddling. But I, it wasn't all plain sailing because, you know, nine out of ten canvases would go in the bin. And it, this, is, I suppose this is an object and a lesson of just never giving up, really, because there were several times I was going to give up. And um, I thought, no, just you, you, first of all, you just can't give up. You just can't give in. But every so often, a square inch somewhere would go okay, and it would like that would be like the light at the end of the tunnel, and I would uh, that would keep me going. Anyway, a couple of years after I started with the paints, we had another exhibition in Bristol, 30 original oil paintings, and they sold out as well. And we're talking what we're talking early 90s now, so that was the start of it, Alistair. And I've now been, I suppose, I've been a professional painter now for longer over 30 years and longer than I actually play cricket for. So. And it, it keeps me sane. It's sort of like I've got to, if I go a day without painting, I get a bit irritable and my wife gets the brunt of it. And, um, and, I, and I, you know, I just feel like I, I'm, I'm so obsessed with it now, um, a bit like I was when I was playing cricket. I'm just so full on with it. That, and I'm lucky enough that, you know, we've got a, we had a, gallery, we've got a gallery in Chip and Sobbury. Um, I've had several books published and we've got our own gallery website. So, People can Google it and see all the pictures that I've been doing and what we're up to. And um, and I, I just, it sort of keeps me sane. A lot of my teammates say would say that that was impossible <laughs> um, over the years. But it, it sort of, 
it's my I just love it you know I've got it every day and I just don't like missing an opportunity I'm always looking at the weather outside is you know is, is there something to paint and I do like to go out in the country a lot and paint like Constable did and paint on the spot and even if I paint cricket grounds now I need to go there like I did with the ashes um I, I painted the ashes series from last year and uh I've only just finished those because they've taken me a year to do and uh to be back at the cricket again and painting on the sidelines on the boundary edge is such a thrill. When the Aussies are in town, my knowledge there, I tend to feel like I need to jump over the boundary and get involved. And that, I've always got to resist the, the temptation to dive into the game, but um, it's the next best thing for playing for me is to actually uh, be out there painting cricket. So I'm, I'm just very lucky. I'm really lucky to have two jobs over the years that I love doing, you know, and they've paid the bills and, I, like you, you know, we'd have done it anyway, wouldn't we? We'd have played yeah. cricket anyway. In those days, we probably we did. We didn't get paid a lot early <laughs> on. You know, we did do it for love, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I, you know, even if I had to get another job now, I'd still paint on top of that other job. But for me, and I thank people every day that want to see my pictures and, and collect them and put them... That I don't think an artist can get any bigger compliment than when somebody says, I want to put your picture on my wall at home. You know, that's the biggest thrill. I get as big a thrill from that as I did running out playing for Gloucestershire or England. You know, I just, uh, I'm just very lucky. Very lucky, but also very talented in, in two fields, Jack. Absolutely fantastic to talk to you again. And uh, good luck with the painting. And I hope I'll see you around at a cricket ground sometime oh, the... soon. Yeah, you take care and we'll catch up and uh, we'll have another natter. Okay, cheers, Jack. Thanks so much. Cheers, Alistair.